welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our special joint IAB Life Sciences Seminar and Centennial Lecture Series. So thank you to the Centennial Lecture Series for, for partnering up with um, IAB. And I'm Mary Beth Lee. I'm a faculty member here in the Institute of Arctic Biology. And I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Michael Nelson. So Michael is an environmental scholar, writer, teacher, speaker, consultant, and professor of environmental ethics and philosophy at Oregon State University, where he currently holds the Ruth H. Spaniel Endowed Chair of Renewable Resources. Uh, Michael is also the um, lead principal investigator for the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest long-term ecological research site in Oregon, and he's the first person, to my knowledge, who is a non-hard scientist to hold the position of lead PI of an LTER site, which are these, as you know, a, a network of a National Science Foundation-funded ecological research sites. And I think that speaks a lot to the importance um, of uh, reintegrating humanities with ecological science, and that it's exciting to see that NSF is acknowledging that as well. Um, Michael, of course, is an intellectual leader in the arena of reintegrating sciences with humanities to address major environmental issues. And this is the context in which we've gotten to be um, collaborators, and it's a joy to get to work with Michael. So in his research and his writing, Michael clearly articulates why science alone cannot solve our environmental problems, and why it's necessary to combine it with ethical and moral perspectives in order to take on the grand social ecological challenges of our time. So one outstanding example of his work in this arena is this book uh, called Moral Ground that he co-edited with Kathleen Dean Moore. Um, Moral Ground, Ethical Action for a Planet in Peril. He spoke about this yesterday at the Northern Alaska Environmental Center. And this is a book that, um, in which they uh, compiled essays that they solicited from some of their friends, pretty obscure people like the Dalai Lama <laughs> and uh, Barack Obama and E.O. Wilson and uh, Barbara Kingsolver. People like that. So, uh, Michael, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're close. <laughs> Michael's got friends in high places. <laughs> um, he also leads by example, I think, uh, with respect to integration of arts, humanities, and sciences in his research, which we'll hear about today. Today, he'll talk about his research project combining environmental ethics with wildlife biology to address the questions of um, the wolf moose relationship on Isle Royal in Michigan. So uh, prior to joining Oregon State University, where he is now, Michael has had, had faculty positions at Michigan State University, the University of Idaho, and the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point. And I just also want to remind you that after today's seminar, there'll be a, a, a reception in the lobby, so I encourage you to stay around and chat informally with Michael and with each other. So how many of you guys are scientists in the audience? How many people identify as artists? Yes. Okay. <laughs> or people from the humanities? Okay, more than one of the above? All right, great. So we've already got a victory here of uh, Sorry, <laughs> getting you all in the same room. Um, but tonight there will also be a potluck at Roger Reese's house. There are some maps up here if you want to grab one. And potluck starts at 6, I think we decided. <laughs> Is that right? Okay, great. Um, so without any further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Michael Nelson. <laughs> Thank you for that really nice introduction. Nice introductions make me very nervous, because uh, then people expect good stuff. Um, and I would have prepared more if I, if I would have known that. So um, I'm a philosopher by training, but I work as much these days uh, with ecologists, uh, in fact, more with ecologists and social science and scientists, and as one of them, uh, as I do uh, anything else, and just whatever it takes. I, I think of myself as almost completely undisciplined uh, these days. That um, actually just means nobody would profess to own me. Uh, and when I started working on the Al Royal Wolf Moose Project, one of the reasons why um, I came together with my colleagues John and Rolf was because we, we realized that we had the same interest at the end of the day. Even though we did really, really different things, it seemed like, and we used really different words, and they had to explain to me what R squared meant. Uh, and I had to explain to them who Kant was, um, that we really had, they didn't care. Uh, we, had, we, had, we were interested in the same thing, and we shared something that many people in environmental science and many people in environmental ethics are ultimately trying to figure out how it is that we should live in the world. What's an appropriate way to live in the world? We don't always articulate it that way, but we can come to see it that way. Um, and I, I, find, uh, <laughs> I find solace in the, the work that I do because there's nothing new about what I do. People have been talking about this for a long time. It's just that nobody pays attention to them. 
because they're really obscure people like Aldo Leopold, um, who made uh, a point in 1935. You have to think about when this point was made uh, in 1935. And he describes modern ecology, um, and he's sort of depressed about modern ecology. He says it's the, uh, the creation of two groups, each of which seems barely aware of the existence of each other. The one studies the human community almost as if it were a separate entity and calls its findings sociology, economics, and history. The other studies the plant and animal community and comfortably relegates the hodgepodge of politics to the liberal arts. We think we're very enlightened these days to say things like, you know, but humans matter too. Um, it's barely an epiphany. But Leopold is prophetic in, in this sense. And he says that we're going to fix this. He was just... Uh, overly optimistic about how soon. Uh, he said, the inevitable fusion of these two lines of thought will perhaps constitute the outstanding uh, advance of the present century. Maybe it's the present century that he's talking about. And Vannevar Bush, uh, this was a, an article that was written in 1945, and this was an article that ultimately uh, created some of the foundation that became the National Science Foundation. Uh, so Vannevar Bush uh, talks about the value of science um, that to secure a high level of employment, to maintain a position of world leadership, the flow of new scientific knowledge must be both continuous and substantial. But, he says, and this is the part everybody rips out of this article, it would be folly to set up a program under which research in the natural sciences and medicine was expanded at the cost of the social sciences, humanities, and other studies so essential to national well-being. So many of our predecessors know this. Uh, many of the people that we think of as really important in, in wildlife, uh, which is where I identify most, uh, have, have realized this at some point in their life. It's usually after retirement uh, that they realize this. Um, so as a philosopher, when I think about ecology and when I think about anything, I think about arguments. Uh, that's the way my mind works. I just think about arguments that people make and arguments that people use to try to persuade somebody. Um, and I want to start to talk about Isle Royale by talking about wolves in Michigan. So this is just a standard growth curve of wolves in Michigan. And there's a standard, um, I don't know, response curve that I've seen that corresponds with this growth curve. And it's somewhere in the middle of the, this growth curve where people say, we've got a problem. Uh, and then they propose all kinds of things. And the problem is always about intolerance. Um, that they say things like this. They say, you know, people are fed up with wolves and about to take matters into their own hands. And so when I see people say things like that, I think you're making an argument. You're just stating part of it. And so maybe that argument looks a little bit like this. Um, an argument is just a series of premises, right, evidence that they're supposed to support a conclusion, a claim. Uh, that people are beginning to devalue wolves at a certain point in that growth curve. And that the devaluing of wolves is eventually going to lead to the harm of wolves. But we ought not do that which leads to the harm of wolves. Therefore, the conclusion is we need to prevent that devaluing of wolves. And of course, they've always got an idea how you do it, right? And it's always something like this, X, Y, or Z, whatever it is. Hunting, delisting, culling is going to prevent the devaluing of wolves. Therefore, we ought to do, to do that. So as a philosopher, I, I not only think about creating arguments, but I think about assessing arguments um, and thinking about, you know, is an argument sound or unsound? So in this case, I think we can raise questions or can ask questions about premise one. Is that really true? So when I was living in Michigan, people said that all the time, but simply because you say things all the time doesn't mean they're true. We probably say we're better looking than we are all the time, but it doesn't make it true. Uh, so one of the things we did to test that premise was you know, just created a small survey, got it instituted in this state of the state survey, and just ask people on a scale of one to five, Likert scale, um, how much they agree with this statement. I enjoy knowing wolves exist in Michigan. Uh, that was an you know, indication of tolerance or how fed up were they really. Uh, and this is just the result that, that we saw. When actually asked, um, it doesn't seem like that premise is actually true. Obviously, this patterns people in the Upper Peninsula have a different attitude than people in the Lower Peninsula. And, People who are old have different opinions than people who are young. Uh, so this is overall. So this is just a, a model of what I mean. You can ask yourself whether this premise is, is true or not. You can try to verify or falsify the, uh, the things that we believe about whatever, including wolves, 
um, with actual empirical work, which is way better than just making it up. And in fact, this is absolutely consistent with what, uh, with, with what Derwood Allen, who started the Isle Royale Moose, Wolf Moose Project, believed. Absolutely consistent. In fact, he says, I started this project to verify or disprove all of the truths and fictions that have been handed down in the natural and unnatural history of man's relationship with the wolf. So he was not neutral in, in that sense. He knew we were basing policy upon assumptions for which we didn't have any information. Um, so he wanted to test those, those claims. <clears throat> so to Isle Royal, how many have been to Isle Royal? How many people? Yes, right. They always only sit in the middle of the auditorium. They're usually huddled together. Uh, so Isle Royale is the, uh, one of the least visited national parks in the country, uh, but it is the most revisited national park in the country. People love uh, going back there. Uh, all six of them uh, love, love going back there. So the island itself is 210 square miles. It's about 45 miles long. It's about nine miles wide. Uh, and it sits about depending on where you would leave uh, the mainland from. You know, the minimum is about 12 miles off of um, sort of where Minnesota uh, and Canada meet. And it is home to um, a single predator and a single prey, um, wolves and moose. Uh, there are some beaver there that, uh, that wolves eat, but it's only about 3% of their diet. So it's mostly just these two, these two critters. Uh, the thing that you, I feel really weird saying this, uh, in, in Fairbanks, Alaska, but Isle Royale is really beautiful. Uh, it's different beautiful, right? The, the beauty is really um, subtle. This might be what it looks like when you, uh, when you arrive on the ferry, for instance. It's usually not that calm, but um, this would be, you know, this is a typical summer scene with fog coming into the bays and being sort of pulled up over, over the hills. This is a... Uh, a winter scene, which is really beautiful, but it also means you're not going to fly that day. Uh, and pretty soon, uh, there'll be scenes like this, with the ice retreating. And then this is just a, a kind of typical shot from, uh, from the, the airplane, uh, when you're going to go out and count wolves and moose. Sometimes funky colors show up. And these are some of the last uh, re recent pictures within the last two years of some of the last wolves on Isle Royal. These, in fact, I think are the two last wolves. <clears throat> this was a wolf, um, Matilda, I think. They typically don't have names, but this one did. Uh, this wolf was absolutely being just tormented by another pack. Um, they were just trying to kill her with everything they, they could muster. And uh, the sort of miraculously ice formed between the island and the mainland, and she escaped. She took off for the mainland. Uh, and the moment she hit the mainland, she was shot and killed. Uh, so it's just like, yeah, uh, the, the, the drama is, is ridiculous. So this is just a timeline uh, of, of the project, just with a few highlights. So Isle Royale is not very old, right? Glacial Lake, Wisconsin, um, you know, drains uh, and Lake Superior Basin settles and Isle Royale sort of pops up out of Lake Superior. So, you know, roughly 8,500 years old. Um, Moose probably didn't arrive. There's no reason to believe they arrived as an established population until just after 1900. The exact uh, year is unknown, but around 1910, 1914, something like that. Uh, and they lived there by themselves without wolves as an established population for about 50 years. Uh, and then uh, Derwood Allen uh, was waiting for this to happen. He was confident it was going to happen. Wolves were going to make it to Isle Royale. Uh, and he wanted to start the Wolf Moose Project, but of course couldn't get any funding. Uh, same story now as, as then. So he had to wait roughly 10 years to start the project. And his first graduate student was Dave Meach. So this is a picture of a, of a young Dave Meach who spent two or three uh, seasons uh, on the project. And then they you know, really thought a lot about how do you count wolves and moose. Uh, evidently that took 25 years. I'm sort of suspicious about how long that took. Uh, it seems like counting, but... Uh, and eventually what happened is they started, as you know, people who study things for a long time do, they start to see other relationships as important. And so the idea that, and, and also they're witnessing changes. They're witnessing the, the island change, the vegetation of the island change. So all of a sudden, forage, the forage base becomes of interest to them. 
And then evidently, they got really bored, and they decided, wouldn't it be fun to hang out with artists and philosophers? Uh, and so in the mid-2000s, uh, actually, this is a watercolor painting by Rolf Peterson, the scientist. So he became interested in, in art. Uh, and we started working with filmmakers. And this is when I, I started working with the project. So as Mary Beth said, it's the longest continuous study of a predator-prey system in the world. Uh, it'll be 60 years old. It just finished its 59th uh, winter season. Um, just to, for those of you who are familiar with LTER, uh, our LTER site is 37 years old, so it's, it's much older than that. And that this, is, this is an unbelievably rare phenomenon. Uh, Robert May uh, reported on some studies uh, by Weatherford and, and Tillman, uh, and the, you know, the idea is that the mean duration time of an ecological study is 2.5 years, right? Because that's, that's how long you have a graduate student, so uh, 2.5 years. And of studies that lasted uh, more than five years, there's only 1.7% of studies that last more than five years. Because that's a really not very progressive graduate student who's not getting through their program or something. So we're not very good at this. We're not very good at paying attention to things for a long period of time. And we know that. We're not, we know culturally we know that, right? We don't live in a house what's more than four and a half years. It's the average time in a house. We don't, I mean, I, I won't ask how many of you are divorced, but... Um, you know, a lot of us are divorced. A lot of us aren't very good at that stuff either. We're not good at this. So it's a weird cultural phenomenon that we, that we have. It's also a really unique system because you have three unexploited trophic levels, predator and prey and forest. There's, there's no exploitation of, of anything in that way on the island. So when I first started working on the, uh, the Wolf Moose Project, uh, the only thing I really knew about ecology other than kind of, you know, a made-up Sesame Street version of, of ecology uh, was uh, was that. So that's, uh, but I didn't actually know it as that because that's math. Uh, I knew it as this. I just knew Laca Volterra, right? Predator-prey relationships operated in this sort of you know smooth cycle of increase and and decrease. And so that's what I expected to see when uh, John and Rolf started sharing um, sharing the, the work with me. But the Isle Royal data set doesn't, I mean, I guess if you squint or, you know, go like this, you can see little moments of Laca Volterra. Uh, but the real system in which you really have a single predator and a single prey, as close as we get in ecology, doesn't really look like that. It's weirder than that. Uh, it's rougher than that. And every single, every single year on, on this graph is interesting and fascinating. But chunks of time are really interesting. So if you take that first five years, I'll just tell you a couple stories of, of chunks of time. Um, and you look at the date, right? Early 1960s. I think that means I was wrong. <laughs> Maybe a motion sensor. Though. That'll work. So the, the dominant, you know, the dominant way we expressed, we've always expressed ecology with metaphors. And the, the, the metaphor at this time was the sort of metaphor of harmony. It was a musical metaphor. Um, and if you study something for five years, the system for five years, which remember is only, you know, 1.7% of all ecological studies even last that long. Uh, and you made a pronouncement about what you saw, which in fact Derwood Allen was asked to do on the pages of National Geographic. Um, what do you see? And... Derwood Allen said, we see uh, harmony. We see this sort of balance coming back. Um, and so that's it. And people asked him, OK, so are you, are you done? He's like, well, no, because I don't know if it changed. I don't know if it would change unless I kept paying attention. So he kept paying attention. And of course, it did change quite dramatically. And then you see some really big episodes, uh, clearly, just in the, in the graph. Um, and so this episode in the, late, in the early 1980s this is canine parvovirus. So canine parvovirus you know, shows up in the world and spreads everywhere. And even though dogs are not allowed on Isle Royal, people aren't real good rule followers. Uh, and somebody brings their dog, and wolves contract parvovirus. And they go from their all-time high of 50. Uh, they decrease by 80% down to about 12. They recover a little bit, you see. And then they sort of crash down, and they just stay, they stay down for about a decade. So they're really hammered for about a decade. And you see moose responding to that, to that decrease really dramatically. Um, and then you see this. So the, uh, the black dot at the top of this gray bar 
uh, I've been told is the highest density of moose ever recorded in the world. And the bottom dot at the, on the gray uh, bar is the highest density of moose carcasses ever recorded in the world. So this is a one, once in a century winter that comes along in 1996, and again, 80% uh, decline. So just like dead moose everywhere, all over the islands, the, maybe the stinkiest island in the history of the world. And the interesting story right now, of course, is what's going on now. Um, so we see um, almost a total disappearance of wolves. Uh, predation really has not been present for five or six years on the island, even though there still are a couple of wolves. And moose have responded very dramatically. So for the last five or six years, on average, moose have increased about 21% every single year, which is what moose do if there are no predators. So that's how we know there's no, no predation. Twinning rates, um, moose having twins is, is phenomenal. When I, when I started doing some research, I started reading old documents. And some of the old ecologists, uh, including uh, Adolf Murray, uh, visited Isle Royal and were charged with estimating the moose herd because there was... Isle Royal always had this, uh, uh, this mystical um, sort of quality to it. And people were like, wow, this is a magical island that can host infinite numbers of moose. Uh, and so there's the, the great herds of, of moose on Isle Royal, which very quickly became the moose problem on Isle Royal. And so this is just, I started reading these documents, and I'm like, wow, they're, men- they're, they're giving me moose estimates. I have no idea how they're doing it. Uh, and I'm pretty sure however they're doing it is probably not a very good way to do it. But I want to I keep track of that. So, uh, so I got a piece of, piece of graph paper. <laughs> Students are like, what's graph paper? <laughs> <laughs> So I just started putting these, these dots. And so this is what we see. Uh, this is the system prior to wolves arriving in 1949. And we just see this sort of precipitous buildup with a very big error bar uh, and just an absolute crash at this time. And then they try to sort of recover, but the, the, base, the vegetative base is, is absolutely hammered and they don't, they don't make it. So this is, this is what we've been able to understand what the moose population was like. This is the best we can do, what it was like before wolves arrived. So this is the group of people. Lots of people do lots of different things, education, um, film, uh, genetics, uh, garbage can, bone boiling, uh, you know, what, whatever it takes, uh, philosophy, flying planes. Uh, and we just for fun counted up just this group of eight people, if you count up how many years of experience uh, people have had on Isle Royal, it's 180 years of collective experience at least. Um, we quibbled over when people started. Um, and they uh, insisted that I only get a half a year credit, which I thought was just really mean. But no, they did it. <laughs> so this is what, uh, this is typical. This is normal. So normally there are between 700 and 1,200 moose on the island and 18 to 27 wolves. And typically, and I feel just weird even saying typically because there's nothing typical, uh, they, they li- the wolves live in three different packs, sort of distributed across the island like this. Uh, there's been one pack and there have been five packs, uh, but normally there are, there are three packs. So the long-term average, just think about this, you know, the long-term average of moose and wolves, 1,000 moose and 24 wolves, and wolves living in three packs. So just to give you a sense of, of how we know all this stuff, um, you know, essentially what you're doing is every year you're counting. So you're flying in a little airplane uh, during the winter. The park is closed in the winter, and so we have permission to go out there in the winter uh, and fly and do counts. And you count, uh, you count wolves by going one, two, three, four, five, six. So wolves are things that even philosophers could count. Did I get it right? Maybe philosophers. <laughs> six. Yeah, maybe I should take that back. Uh, so that's winter study, and uh, the, mystery, the murder mystery writer Nevada Barr became fascinated with winter study for some weird reason and kept asking if she could come out uh, to write a murder mystery uh, at winter study. So finally they let her, uh, and then she came out and uh, burned up all the wood uh, and was really quite a pain. Uh, but wrote a book called uh, Winter Study, and it's, uh, if you like kind of mediocre murder mysteries, it's... <laughs> I, 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 I endorse it. Uh, if, if you read the book and you notice where the bodies are stored when people get killed and they're stored in this cabin, that's where I sleep, actually. When I, when I, yeah. It took me like half the book to notice that. So moose are very different because there's so many of them and they're hard to find. 
um, you're, you have one by one square mile plots, and every year you're revisiting these same plots, and you're flying this vomit-inducing pattern uh, over those plots in this little tiny super cub, uh, and then you're coming up with estimates uh, from that point. Uh, at some point, of course, when uh, genetic analysis became really interesting, um, you know, we became more interested in collecting pee and poop. Uh, so we were really interested in, in lots of genetics. Uh, John Busetich's wife, Leah, has, has heads that up. And all along, uh, people have been absolutely obsessed with bones. Uh, every bone we can find, um, we, we collect, and we, can, we, can, we know when the moose died. Uh, and we can sort of, we, we learn all kinds of things by having this long history of moose bones. They're all, if you're interested in moose bones, uh, there's a, a building at Michigan Tech University where they all are. It's called the Moose Museum. Um, and you can go visit a stinky barn full of moose bones. So back to arguments, though, and, and to thinking about, I want to think about what we've discovered on Isle Royal in terms of an argument. I want to make it, I want to make it relevant. Um, because a lot of the, a lot of the ways we propose that we ought to live with wolves are premised upon what kind of creatures we think they are. And this is not just true of wolves. This is true of many creatures. It's true of other humans, actually. So we build arguments like this. We don't do it so formally, but, uh, but if we did it formally, we say things like this. We say, well, wolves have certain qualities, um, and we attribute them certain qualities. And we say things like, well, they're, they're gratuitous killers. And nobody says they're gratuitous killers, yay. That's just an inevitably negative quality. So we say, well, that's something we, we shouldn't tolerate, and therefore we shouldn't tolerate wolves. Um, and you can swap out words and everything, but essentially I think this is what people suggest. And I think you can take some of the scientific discoveries from Isle Royal and you can challenge that first premise. You can think to yourself, is this really true? Uh, I know it's popular to say, and it has impact in the world, and lots of things die because of it, uh, but is it really true? Are we smart to believe this premise? And the first thing I would do as a philosopher is I would say, well, it, what do you mean by gratuitous? Because um, that's how we roll. And so I think gratuitous could mean three different things. And I just I look to the way people speak about gratuitousness. I think sometimes they think, well, it's easy for them to kill. Therefore, they have a great impact on their prey. Or they say, no, they are by nature gluttonous beings. Uh, and therefore, they have an impact on their prey. It's mostly about prey. Uh, and they're wasteful. Uh, so there's lots of references to this. Or they say things like, no, they underutilize their prey, and they're, they're wasteful. That's what I mean when I say gratuitous. And you can take each one of these, and you can look at the Isle Royal Wolf Moose Project, uh, and you can ask questions about whether or not we should believe any of these. So let's just start with easy. If you're a wolf, how easy is it to kill a moose? on Isle Royal. So we studied this population long enough to be able to have seen different parts of kill sequences. So I'm going to show you a series of photos that, is, that looks like one kill sequence, but it's actually woven together from a, a set of kill sequences. So the first thing that happens when wolves encounter moose, which they do all the time, um, they live on an island, uh, they're seeing one another all the time, so the first thing that wolves do is, usually one of them, runs up to the moose as fast as it can, and it stops and puts the brakes on, and it just stares at the moose. And if the moose is between three and, say, eight years old and otherwise healthy, uh, the moose might pull its head up and look at the wolf. Or it might just ignore the wolf entirely and just keep browsing, for instance. So typically, that's the end of it. And that's a typical sequence. That's typically what happens. Um, sometimes the wolf backs off and tries it again, just you know, in case it was a you know, a, a really well-acted moose or something like that. Um, but if there's something wrong with the moose, uh, if it has jaw necrosis, if it has arthritis, if it's young, old, uh, there's a fear response, which typically results in the moose turning and running. Uh, and then wolves follow, as you see. So only one in 20 wolf moose encounters, like I just described, actually ends in a kill. This is one of the very first discoveries on Isle Royal, is that this is... Uh, uh, this is selective killing. If you went to McDonald's 20 times and only got one Happy Meal, uh, you would not think that McDonald's is the gratuitous giver of Happy Meals. Um, this is very, very selective. There's a lot of work for a 1 in 20 kill. So the goal, of course, is eventually you've got you to think about what's happening here. The moose is running. It's 900 pounds. 
on average, it's scared. Uh, it has big, powerful legs in the back. You're 75 or 80 pounds, and somebody's job, uh, somebody has the job of, of latching onto the moose with, you have to do it with your teeth. <laughs> and you have to slow the moose down. And eventually that's what actually happens. Somebody latches onto the back end of the moose. And of course the moose is running, you're bouncing through whatever's underneath the snow at the same time. Almost every single, I think, every single carcass of a wolf that we've ever recovered has broken ribs, cracked skulls. Um, it's, it's not, it's, I'm kind of giving away the end, but this is not an easy thing. I would say many things of this relationship, but I would not call it easy. These episodes can last for as short as 15 minutes, and they can last for as long as 15 hours. Um, so there is really, there's huge variation. This is just a scene that clearly um, has, has t taken a while uh, blood streaming down the which, what is still a very very dangerous animal. Uh, sometimes everybody gets really really tired, and everything just stops. Um, it doesn't mean that the wolf lets go; they never let go. Um, so they just pause. There's just a pause in the action. This is not a good sign for the moose at this point, but it's also not a good sign for the wolf. All that moose has to do is kind of wiggle its butt, uh, and that that wolf could be in that tree. Sometimes there's there's injury. This is an amazing shot of a, of a moose actually kicking a wolf uh, in the sort of belly, and it, you know, almost like a cartoon, uh, kind of imploding in, in, into the air. But the goal is eventually somebody goes around and grabs a hold of the nose. And once you have the nose, you have control, and you can drag the, the moose to the ground, and then, then dinner begins. This is just an aerial shot of a wolf killed moose. Um, <laughs> My, my wife and I had this shot uh, printed and framed, and then we hung it over our dog's bowl uh, to, to remind them that not everybody has it this easy. Uh, we, just, we think it's hilarious, and they, we're frustrated that they don't think it's very funny. So again, you can say a lot of things about these episodes and this relationship. I don't think, you would, I don't think using the word easy is probably the appropriate word to use. So what about gluttonous? What about impact and wastefulness? How much impact are we actually talking, right? You've studied this system uh, for 50 years, for you know, nearly 60 years. What, what do we know about impact, right? We want to know that. We want to know things like kill rates or predation rates, however you prefer to phrase that. And we think that's a really relevant thing for society. We want to know what kind of impact these animals are having on animals that we're interested in as, as well. So what have we learned about about kill rates over time, especially. So we started studying kill rates in 1971, uh, and in this case, kill rate is just measured by kilograms of wolf of uh, wolf of food uh, per wolf per day, and so each box is one one pack in, in one winter season. And so in the first season, you know, this is uh, this was a season that had five packs actually, or the first three seasons. Um, this is this is what we learned. So. Again, three seasons, right? You, most people stop at this point. And if you stopped here, you would say, well, you know, kill rate is in this, in this range. Well, what happens if you pay attention over a longer period of time? So this is to 1975. This is to 1980. This is to 1985. Now, at this point, none of these numbers and boxes mean anything until I put these lines on there. So the middle red line is what a wolf needs to continue to exist over a period of time. This is you know, minimum requirement. Uh, the line on the left is half of that, and the line on the right is twice that. Um, so when you see those lines and then you look at those blue boxes, it's hard to actually make sense of that. So it means that some wolves are getting less than half of what they need to continue to survive, and some wolves in some years are getting more than twice what they need to survive. And so when I say, what's the kill rate, it's, it's a strange question to kind of, kind of answer. If you just keep, uh, just keep going, I'll stop in 2010 here. It piles up like that. And the, the, you know, the, the bar on the right is un unbelievable. I don't know how you eat that much, actually. So this is one of the things I think is really valuable about long-term ecological research. If I just showed you that first histogram, you would make a pronouncement that you would not make if you paid attention to this system uh, for a long period of time. So what happens over a period of time is that the range of confidence decreases significantly, that observations made over a shorter period of time might be more precise but less accurate than those made over a longer period of time, which may, may be more accurate but less precise.
So there's a difference between precision and accuracy. So it's hard to answer that question. And, and remember, to make the argument work, that premise has to be true. It's hard to say that that premise is true uh, when you just look at that range of, of kill rates. So what about underutilization? Do they underutilize uh, a carcass, for instance? Uh, this is an extreme carcass. This is by no means typical. Um, but it is a carcass. This could be what's left after, like, say, two weeks of visiting and revisiting uh, a carcass. Um, you, you notice what's there, really big bones that would be hard to eat, but you notice also, you might not notice what's not there. Uh, there's very little bloody snow. There's no hair. Um, there's nothing little uh, that, that's left. So this would be like an amazingly stripped carcass. And, of course, at the end of the day, somebody will, somebody will eat this. So this is one of the, the uh, one of the things we study. We want to know we want to know about this phenomenon: partial prey consumption. How much of a carcass does some kind of animal here, wolves, eat? And this is I don't have to explain this, but the point is actually really simple. Um, one of the things that we've discovered is that when times are good, when prey is abundant, wolves eat less of a carcass. When times are bad, they eat more of a carcass. The thing that's interesting, or maybe not interesting about that, is there's nothing unusual about that. Uh, that's a very widespread phenomenon. There's nothing unique about wolves. Uh, many, many animals do that, including human beings. So we, ha we have colleagues who are called garbologists um, who go into old garbage dumps. And they can sort of date garbage dumps. And they can study food consumption uh, in these garbage dumps. And so the same phenomenon that we see here, partial prey consumption, um, you know, you eat less in good times and more in bad times is also true of human beings. So we're, we, you know, if we were to really insist upon that version of gluttony, then we're implemented in all of that too. We ought not to be tolerated either. Maybe that's true for some of us. So I think in this case, you know, I'm thinking of, as a philosopher, I'm thinking about arguments. Um, that premise has to be true in order for that argument to be true. But I think there's really good reasons to doubt that premise. So that's one way I think, I mean, Mary Beth il illustrated or sort of said that one of the things I'm interested in is this connection between arts, or between humanities and science. And that's one way to bring these things together. An ethical argument requires that I have an understanding of certain ecological facts about the world. But I think there's another way, and I think Iowa Royal helps us with another way of thinking about that relationship between the humanities and the sciences. Um, we like to describe not only relationships, but we like to describe systems. And we think about, you know, we think about Isle Royale as a kind of closed system, and we, we ask questions like, well, what kind of a system is it? And we have ways to think about that. We ask questions like, is it a top-down system or a bottom-up system? Uh, and then we have ways that we answer that, that question. So if you look at um, Isle Royale over time and you ask that question, uh, the answer is, is this. It's largely, it seems like, a, a climate-driven system. Climate variations seem to determine. Remember, the, the moose crash was really a climate phenomenon. But one of, the things that's, one of the things that's really cool that you can do with a 50-year data set is you can play games with it. You can chop it up in, in all kinds of interesting ways. And so if you look at the IRL system over time, and you draw, we often say the parvo um, episode was the most important thing that happened in the, in, the, in the wolf population. And you draw a line there, and you say, well, how would you describe that system in the first 25 years as compared to the last 25 years? And, and I want to remind you that that's five times what most people have for data uh, to, to make that judgment. Uh, we would see this. In the first 25 or 22 years, it really is largely, it seems like, a, a top-down system. Driven, moose abundance is driven by, by wolf predation. But after parvo, it changes dramatically. It seems to become mostly a climate-driven uh, system. So if you say, is, <laughs> if you ask the question, is Isle Royal a top-down or bottom-up system, uh, it's, not, it's not easy to answer that question. And if you answered that question, even after paying attention for 22 years, you would be forced to answer that question differently in the next 25 years. Uh, and we've done this with all kinds of, you know, it's like, what about five-year periods? What if we broke it up with five years? And so we did a little fun analysis where, you know, really what we see is that every five-year period is differed from every other five-year period. And we're not always sure why they differ. Uh, just like the first 25 years differed dramatically from the second 25 years. 
And as John likes to say, that it seems like the, as time goes on and we study this more, we realize how poor our, under, our previous understandings were. What we end up doing is we discover something, and then we have to retell the story uh, because of some, some discovery. It's a description and a redescription of what we've observed. When I hear that, to be honest, and I think about understanding the natural world, the, the word that comes to my mind immediately is humility. Um, I think of this is, to me, science that, that is humbling uh, in a way. We might be more inclined to, be, you know, to express hubris and predictiveness if we study things for a short period of time. We might be less inclined to do that if we study things over a long period of time. If a lack of humility is one of the reasons why we have some of the problems that we have, uh, and many people have argued that it is, uh, then science that can deliver, or whatever we call this, the synthesis that can deliver humility, seems to be incredibly ethically valuable at this moment in time. So it's, it has this potential to even, I think, you know, shape our virtues or shape our characters. So what's going on now? It's very exciting right now. So these are very inbred wolves. They are descendants of a single male, single female, maybe a little bit of uh, genetic exchange. Uh, Isle Royal wolves over time um, it, uh, demonstrate inbreeding depression, uh, fused toe pads, asymmetrical vertebrae, uh, as you see here, early onset of arthritis, a 33% bone deformity rate. Uh, that's overall in the last 15 years, it's 100%. Uh, bone deformity rate, every carcass we see is, is deformed in some way. And so we learned this by working with a Swedish anatomist, um, and then we published this paper uh, in Biological Conservation, and it raised the question, well, what should we do about this? What should we do about the wolves of, of Isle Royal? So here's where we're at now. In 2015, there was this breeding pair, which are also, you know, cousins and brother and sister and their own grandparents, all... They, uh, John told me that they are so far inbred that we don't even have a word for it in English. And I said, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> we, we wouldn't be here if we had a word for that. And then they're, you know, they're, they're uh, clear um, inbreeding um, produced progeny at, at the end there. Uh, in 2016, uh, largely because of uh, monkeying around with the park, uh, the only thing we saw were two footprints of wolves. Um, and then just this last winter study, uh, it's, it's just those two wolves that are left, and they're, they're not interested in, in reproducing. They haven't, we have reproduced once in, in four years. And reproduction's like the easiest thing for them to do. So um, I want you to just quickly consider another argument, and this is an argument I think we're all going to face, or if we're already facing really quickly. Um, and it looks like this, that the concern that some people have is that in the face of climate change, there are going to be times where we're going to have to intervene in order to secure what we think of as land health, to make the land whole or healthier, however we think of that, it's going to require our intervention. And the worry, of course, is that people are not going to tolerate that, uh, that the public will not support intervention because either they mistrust us or they equate um, land health with non-intervention. And we're in trouble if that's true, um, that we're not going to be allowed to intervene, we're not going to be able to secure land health, and land is going to become increasingly unhealthy. So I'm interested in that second premise. Is that actually true? Uh, are we wise to worry about the public uh, allowing for, for intervention? So what's happened is the park has been collecting public comments. And it started in the fall of 2012, and is actually still continuing now under an EIS um, and then over, across the top is just winter study, the year of winter study, and the wolf moose, um, the wolf moose count. And so uh, we asked the park if they would give us uh, the first 930 public comments. They said no. So we went through the Freedom of Information Act uh, and got them anyway. Uh, and we wanted to understand what people thought we should do by doing a content analysis, a formal content analysis on this public, uh, these public comments. Uh, and we know that. You know, one of the things that's interesting here is we have two years of data, and we know that attitudes can change over two years. I was trying to think of a way uh, to illustrate that, so I thought about, you know, what did Justin Bieber look like in the fall of 2012, and then what did he look like two years later, right? I mean, he was in prison two years later. Uh, and we're all, like, amazingly concerned about the future of the Biebs, 
uh, that he <laughs> might end up like that. that that's what the, uh, the, the rock and roll version of Isle Royale Wolves right now is Keith Richards. They're the Keith Richards of Wolves. So we, we did an analysis on uh, those, those 930 public comments. We wanted to know a number of things. We wanted to know what people thought we should do. And then I wanted to know as, as an ethicist, why? How did they use moral theory to come to their position? So what and, what and why? So these are just the tools of the trade. Um, we had to write a code book. We had to train independent coders. We had to do this enough where we had a high level of intercoder reliability that people independently were coming to the same, the same judgment. Um, the people, if you picked up the code book, you would, you would do the same thing. Um, you all know what an Excel spreadsheet looks like. Uh, this is an incredibly unique thing for a philosopher. Um, so we did half of them. We did 50%. Selected at random, had high intercoder reliability, uh, low 90 percent. Uh, there was a, this is just the email address that the Park Service sent out. And the Park Service actually said, we want to know what you think we should do. And they gave those three options. Do nothing, now or ever, let them go extinct and then reintroduce them, or genetically rescue them now. Uh, and then, like I said, people don't always follow instructions. So pump, some people were saying, well, don't do anything now, but don't rule out the possibility of genetic rescue later. So we had to create a fourth category. And this is what people thought we should do. So we only actually had 428 because 5% of the people who responded to a very clear request to tell us what you think we should do and why could not answer that question. Um, or we couldn't tell. They'd be like, is this email working? It's embarrassing. Or they write like two pages and you're like, I don't know what your policy preference is. Uh, so this is what people thought of, of, of that sample. So people were, you know, you can tice it up in different ways, right? Lots of interest in genetic rescue, uh, reintroduction, and then a small of the don't act now, but don't rule out the possibility. And only 12% were non-interventionists. If you lump people willing to intervene in one category, you get between 86 and 80, 88%, depending on what you want to do with that, that waffling category. So that's the, that's the public opinion, which was very different than the message the park was sending. Uh, they were saying things like, well, p the public is really divided. Well, I mean, if by divided you mean 88% to 12, sure. So as a philosopher, I said, I want to know why, or like how they come to that, that, that reason. And so what I mean by that is uh, um, I'm going to lay 2,500 years of ethical theory on you in like two minutes. Uh, I wanted to know, did they appeal to the consequences? If we intervene or we don't intervene, were they saying this would do something to the science or... This would you know, create suffering, or this would harm something. Right? Was it about the consequences of actions? Utilitarianism fits here. Or were they appealing to some sort of external authority? Were they saying, let the park decide, or let the scientists decide, um, or let God decide, or uh, let nature take its course? That also fits in that category, natural law theory. Or were they appealing to rights? Things have a right to something. Um, or virtues, you know, people of good character would do this. I um, mean, these are very different ways to morally reason to a position. So to the extent that we could tell what people's dominant moral framework was, um, this is what it looked like overall. This is all, this is both interventionist and non-interventionist groups. There's really nothing surprising here. I mean, people have said we are a very utilitarian culture, and that shows up here. Um, the external authority is largely natural law theory. It's largely let nature take its course. Um, and then there were 19% of the people we couldn't, we, we couldn't tell what their dominant moral driver was. But interesting, if you, if you take the interventionist and the non-interventionist and you ask how did they morally reason about this, you see very different forms of moral reasoning in these two, these two end positions. So the interventionists are very, very utilitarian. Uh, and the non-interventionists are very much let nature take its course. Although, interestingly, some people said, let nature take its course, and they were in the interventionist category, therefore intervene, um, which is a very, um, very interesting way to argue. One thing we discovered, I think, I think we all need to pay more attention to this, is people are starting to think about conservation and natural resource issues outside of the human realm as matters of justice. They're not thinking about justice as something that only applies within the human realm. And whether we like that or not, people are thinking that way. We started seeing justice language all over the place. In fact, we didn't have it in our original code book, and then we had to put it in. Uh, and it's mostly this notion of restorative justice. You know, we broke it, 
we should fix it. That's a justice appeal. So 18% of the whole sample were interested in justice. One out of five people uh, had justice on their mind when they were offering their opinion. I have no idea why, but every single one of them was an interventionist. Every single person interested in justice thought we should intervene. Uh, if you're interested in what the pie chart of that looks like, it's just this. <laughs> I, for some reason, I asked for a pie chart of that, and I got a circle. <laughs> I have to get different collaborators. I think. Um, we were interested, and some of you might be interested in, did people mention concern about the Isle Royale Wolf Moose Project? Were they concerned about the science? And so of all the people in the sample who expressed concern for the science, there were 63 of those. Um, and it broke down like this. 84% of them were concerned about the science, and therefore they thought we should intervene. Um, and 16% said we shouldn't intervene. And this is completely anecdotal, but that 16% who were concerned about the science and said don't intervene, uh, by probably an order of magnitude, used more capitals and exclamation marks than anybody else. Uh, I mean, so one person said, if you intervene now, you will negate anything we learned in the past like reverse causation or something. It's just, you know, really, I mean, extreme kind of concerns about intervention and ruining everything that we learned even in the past. So I, and I think one of the ways to frame what we learned publicly is just to ask this question. Is it, is, is it really true in a blanket way that people, the public won't support intervention? Uh, I would never say that what we discovered is the public will support intervention. I think what we discovered is that there may be times, and I don't know when those times will be, where people will not oppose in intervention. Um, there's hope if that's something that we're interested in. So here's where we're at. I just, uh, like two days ago, got an email uh, from, uh, from John. Uh, and I just actually, here's his email. Uh, so moose are growing at 21% a year. And if you just project that out uh, over time, which I did for fun, uh, and I told him he had to, he's going to have to change the scale on one side of the, of the graph, but he's got three years to do it, uh, that in, uh, in three years, uh, moose are going to be at 2,800. I have a hard time believing they're actually ever going to make 2,800. I have no idea when it, I don't know what's going to happen, um, but I, I, I have a hard time believing that. that but that's the, that's the trajectory that, that they're on. Uh, the park has done the initial phase of the EIS. They had seven options that went to four. And they're the, not the park, but the National Park Service has expressed the preference to introduce 30 wolves over three years as soon as possible. Uh, that probably means predation will not exist as a phenomenon. Knowing how the Park Service works, that doesn't mean it's going to happen this year. Uh, so we're still going to see this, this increase. And we, whether those two wolves disappear or not, predation is, is not a factor on the island anymore. I'm going to end in a really different way. I'm going to end um, uh, by thanking you all for coming, thanking Mary Beth for what's been just an amazing visit, um, and thanking Roger for what's going to be awesome. <laughs> so this is a poem I want to read uh, to, as, a, as a thank you. Um, and this is actually an old poem, but you won't believe. Uh, you won't believe it. This is a poem by Gary Snyder. Uh, called For the Children. The rising hills, the slopes of statistics lie before us. The steep climb of everything going up, up, as we all go down. In the next century, or the one beyond that, they say, our valley, pastures, we can meet there in peace if we make it. To climb these coming crests, one word to you, to you and your children. Stay together learn the flowers, go light. So if you're interested in Isle Royale stuff, uh, there's the webpage. Uh, and in fact, the webpage is also on the bookmarks that I brought for you. And if you're interested in my stuff, uh, there's the webpage for that. And that's the end. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, Michael, uh, my concern with your presentation, like the Park Service presentation of this, is the fact that it overlooks or ignores the fact that this is designated wilderness. This is a place our society is set apart to be quite different from other places. And the chief ethical factor here is the purpose of it is to be a place of 
restraint forbearance where we defer to yeah. natural processes and their autonomous creativity. So we shouldn't judge any of those things as up to the natural system evolution. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the things that we see in this debate is the idea of, of, of wilderness, but I actually, which I actually think is a little bit different than non-intervention um, as another value, as a value of land health. There's a set of values that are all important in this debate. Um, and the question is, and this is true in many, many debates. There's nothing unique about this in a way. And the question is, as a society, first of all, we have to recognize the values that are actually at stake. And sometimes we don't do that. Sometimes we lie about it. We don't pretend they're all of value. And then we have to come up with a system of ranking. Uh, th I think the best we're going to do when you have competing values is you're going to try to maximize for as many of these values as you can. Um, but it's not going to be perfect. There's no way to do that perfectly. Uh, and so we have to ask questions like, is the maximization for wilderness, which is a very loaded concept, a very culturally specific concept. Um, many have argued a very antiquated, and some have argued a dangerous concept. Um, is that the value that should take priority over these other values? Um, and I think that's a really great question. And I think the Park Service itself has started to answer this question. The 1963 Leopold Report said that the most important value for the Park Service uh, was non-intervention with the background assumption that if I didn't intervene, that that's, I'm maximizing land health. The 2012 rewrite of the Leopold Report for the National Park Service says it's the preservation of land health. That's the most important value. And so that's really interesting. And that, it doesn't matter whether it's wilderness or not. Uh, those places need to, 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 be, to be healthy. So the Park Service itself has shifted its, its the way it, it has a hierarchy of values. Now, I'm not saying that everybody in the Park Service or the rest of us have caught up to that shift in any way. And that's part of what we're, uh, what we're really what we're debating. I don't think we want to say that the value of wilderness, whatever it might mean, uh, is not important. But we have to say, does it outweigh these other values? And I think many people are saying, no, it doesn't. Um, many people in that 12% were actually a single group of people who all wrote the same thing. And we still counted them as, as individuals. There was a group of people who, who basically made, made that argument. But they were, they were a pretty small group of people in the grand scheme of things. So it's a, it's, we, we started to wonder, does that value still have the same sway over us in the world that we face today that it did uh, in the world where the, the, the wilderness concept evolved? And it seems like it's changing in some way. All these other people in the uh, ups and downs of the moose population, uh, can you just fill us in on some of the uh, habitat productivity, forage, habitat suitability, forage productivity element of this more complex equation? Yeah, I, want, I mean, one of the most interesting things that we're seeing is that, so moose abundance has been so high for 100 years that uh, balsam fir <coughs> Most all the balsam fir the moose have access to are little bonsai trees, even though they're maybe 30 years old. And so one of the things that we, uh, that we saw when moose were sort of low uh, recently, before this recent takeoff, is balsam fir were actually starting to escape the level at which moose could grab them or plow them over or something like that. So for the first time in 100 years, we're not sure what's going to happen actually here, but the first time in 100 years, we actually might have balsam fir that are you know, bigger, than, uh, bigger than that. Um, the, so in some ways, the, many parts of the island are becoming more mature. There was a huge fire in the early 1930s in the middle of the island uh, that probably had a lot to do with the ability of moose to take off in the way that they did. That's not, that habitat isn't there anymore. Um, so it's changing. I mean, and, and you see that in the, the shifts of the territories that wolves have occupied. I mean, wolves, you know, wolves walk the perimeter of the refrigerator is what they do. And, and when their refrigerator moves, their territories shift. So you can actually, I actually never done this, but this is interesting. You could trade, you could, to map on vegetative shifts with territory, uh, with territory borders, I would think you'd see a really strong correlation between those things. I might have a project. We should probably wrap up with about the reception shortly, but yeah. um, I want to thank you very much for coming. We have a, a big 
speaker. It's a speaker beaker for you. All of a sudden, just got together. I'm like a real scientist. <laughs> You're a friend of scientists. Thank you so much. For Really big <laughs> right. So I would like to invite you to, to meet out in the lobby and continue chatting with Michael and with each other out there and the Nats to the party tonight or up here.